Hi, it's Mike again with Ugtastic. Today I'm sitting down with Rob Reynolds. Uh, you might know him as Fervent Coder on Twitter. Uh, he's been around in the .NET community uh, creating open source software for a few years now. Uh, he started with uh, a lot of Chuck Norris theme uh, utilities, uh, Roundhouse and, and uh, Uppercut. And he's even worked on NuGet. And now his latest project that he's working on is called Chocolatey. Uh, it's uh, kind of like apt for Windows. So. Rob, thanks for taking the time to sit down and uh, chat with us today. Thanks for having me. Sure. So uh, we'll, we'll work backwards. We'll start with Chocolatey, and then we'll talk uh, about some of the other projects you've worked with. So what, what is Chocolatey, and why, and how and why did you start to, to work on it? Sure. Uh, Chocolatey is your global silent installer slash updater. Um, now we describe it as kind of like apt-get but mm -hmm. for Windows, um, and the kind of means this is not an apt-get clone, which uh, a lot of people are like, well, this doesn't have apt-get command, you know, uh, <laughs> update, right? Well, it's kind of like apt-get. Um, what it is, is, a, it is a, it's basically a global PowerShell execution engine, and the biggest modules in it right now are about um, getting things installed on your system. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that's all it has to be used for. You can use it for uh, setting configuration values, setting registry, setting all that. Um, we called it Chocolatey because it builds on top of NuGet's packaging infrastructure. And so this is a, a global PowerShell execution engine that knows about packaging and versioning. Mm, okay. So that you could make a new version of some configuration or uh, an application and then just update the package, and somebody could update uh, their system with that. Yeah, and I see like on the, the chocolatey.org website that you have, the first example is, it looks like it's automating an MSI installer to install Git. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're launching and you're using the existing infrastructure for, for doing installs. You're not like installing into a separate directory and linking binaries or anything like that. You're, you're instrumenting and making and scripting these, these installation packages. Correct. And, and the biggest reason for that is there doesn't have to be a huge buy-in to start using Chocolatey uh, from the consumer end. There doesn't have to be a huge buy-in from the creating packages side either because you have this existing infrastructure that's out there. There's MSIs, uh, executables, you know, install shield type, native installers. And Chocolatey hooks right into all that. Uh, the other thing is that Chocolatey doesn't do anything different uh, than what you would do as a regular user, especially when it comes to like distribution rights. So there may be some software out there, let's say something like Resharper, where you're required to go get it from the, the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. uh, Chocolatey has the ability to do that for you. It reaches out and gets it, pulls it down. Mm -hmm. uh, the package instructions tell it that um, you know, here's the silent arguments to install it, and so they can install it. And when you update, you just call um, Chocolatey Update, saying this was ReSharper, mm -hmm. and uh, then it reaches out and it gets the newest package if there is one, and uh, walks back through that same process. Um, so it, you can, I mean, is it, some stuff probably doesn't have a friendly upgrade path or reinstall path. I mean, how do you, uh, do, I mean, do some things you have to say, well, this one's not <clears throat> an upgradable package at this time. It's an install only. Is there a difference between those? Uh, you know, if it doesn't, if the native installer doesn't elegantly handle uh, upgrades, then that's usually a problem with, uh, you know, that package, whoever makes that application. But, yes, yeah, so the chocolatey, that would be, well, this package doesn't do upgrades very well. Um, in the future, what we're looking at doing for those types of packages is during an upgrade, we would just have it uninstall the package or the, the current application and then f flow through to the actual install. Okay. So okay. That you do get that nice thing. We don't have that right now. That's, that's mm -hmm. probably a couple versions up, but it's something that we're thinking about because we do see some of these native installers and I don't know, maybe it's just that the person that makes that application doesn't put forth the effort to make sure you have a nice upgrade story, which is kind of sad. Yeah. And uh, 
So, I mean, ultimately, how what what led you to creating, or did you were you the one that originally created Chocolatey, or yes? Okay, so what uh, what what prompted that? I was looking for a a really good solution to, I mean, at the time, to get the application type executable gems off of Ruby, uh, and this goes back to a bit of history. Um, before NuGet, there was uh, a project that we worked on called New, and uh, it was short for Nubular, and our tagline was New Nice Package. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that used Ruby's infrastructure, and Ruby's infrastructure had both library type gems, mm -hmm. uh, which translates into the nice NuGet DLL uh, libraries, and then it also had executables. So you could set an executable into a gem mm -hmm. and then put that on the path really nicely. And in trying to get the rest of those off of uh, Ruby gems at the request of Nick uh, Quaranto, um, I was looking for a good way to have a machine type repository. And so out of that came the idea of, uh, you know, you got your vanilla nougat and then you got your chocolatey nougat, right? And the chocolatey was for those machine type things. During that period, I realized that uh, we could actually just have it execute uh, PowerShell mm -hmm. uh, in much the same way that NuGet does. And that opened up a world of things that we could do, which brought about the you know installation, configuration, and updating of software, mm -hmm. which really brought it in line with a, a nice uh, answer to the question of um, you know this missing uh, package manager for Windows. And it's not the first time that somebody's tried to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other ones out there. Um, we just tried to make it work with the existing infrastructure as best it could and then, uh, you know, do the trade-offs where necessary and then make the experience for the user and the package creator super simple. Yeah. So and it's growing in popularity pretty quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I was about to ask is, is so it would be good for anything from building a new server to... I'm, I have a developer workstation. I, I I got my new box, and I want to get all my dev tools on there. Just lickety split. I could have my script, my chocolatey script, and then that'll just install everything for me. Yeah, and you could set that up. Uh, in fact, we do that. In fact, I just got done doing that on a project I'm working on for some new devs, bringing them on. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a setup dot uh, ps1 script. It's a PowerShell script. Mm -hmm. First thing it does is install chocolate and it just walks through and starts installing things on the box. If they're already there, it doesn't do anything. Uh, the really nice thing is this is installing everything from um, service packs for pa uh, I'm sorry for Visual Studio to um, SQL Server Express gets installed, uh, and all of this is completely automated. And then they get IIS and IIS extension. I'm sorry, Express, and then all of the different things that are needed with IIS. Uh, and this all happens. They can get up and go get a coffee and come back. Oh, I was going to say, a Visual Studio install has to be more than a coffee. It uh, <laughs> takes a little longer than that. Yeah, uh, walk to Bolivia and get a coffee. <laughs> uh, the reason we're able to do that is that uh, Chocolatey integrates with other package managers. And if I wanted to install something that was like uh, Compass, which is on Ruby, or Autosave, which is on Node, mm -hmm. um, which are things that we also install during this, or um, Bash, which is on Sigwin, or anything that comes from uh, the web platform uh, installer, so that's like MVC um, or any Windows components. Um, all of those, I just change the source that I'm going to. So when I go chocolatey install, and I'd say like compass, and then I put uh, slash source Ruby. And if I don't have Ruby installed on that box yet, the first thing it's going to do is install it, and then it's going to install compass. Wow, that's uh, that sounds uh, pretty. Uh... Uh, pretty uh, intense. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it, you know, and, and for the end user, that becomes such a super simple process, right? Uh, now, if you've ever had to install like Dev Kit on a Windows machine, you know that can be kind of yeah. a hairy process. Um, we built a, we took basically the instructions that were out on the wiki, set them into a PowerShell script, commented them all out, and then made that all automated. And so when you go to install Dev Kit, mm -hmm. we'll install Ruby first if it's not installed. And then it installs DevKit. So it's just a one line guy, and you got DevKit. Yeah. And take that from how it used to could, how it used to be, 
then you can see that that's uh, quite an improvement on the process. So do you have like a recipe library that you guys work with or or how do how do people go about um building a new I mean so so how do you deal with contributors? I guess is the question. Do you have people who are building scripts and they want to uh, contribute them to a main repo? Is there something like a rubygems.org? Yes, ruby.org. Um, and that is the uh, the community, I would say the community official repository, right? What was that, what was that repo again? Chocolatey.org. Oh, Chocolatey.org is where That's, all the packages Chocolatey is spelled E-Y, right? We spell it a little bit more British mostly because it to me it looks more like it should. It doesn't look as weird and um, it was available as a domain. <laughs> That's very important. Name a product because you can actually buy a domain. And uh, in this case, that was one of those products. Um, plus, like I said, it's a play on chocolatey, chocolatey nougat. So, so, um, so but, but people who want to contribute, how do you, how do you go about rec receiving? Or are you guys making all of the recipes? Or how does that work? Uh, we have what we consider the helper modules or the utilities. Uh, utility modules that you can use. You're, uh, of course, you don't have to use them. You can write as much as you want into that chocolatey install script, and then when uh, the package gets consumed, chocolatey looks for that script, and if it's there, it uh, just does everything that's there listed there. Now, the important thing to note is that chocolatey by default is not going to run as an administrator. So, anytime you need administrator access, administrative access, you're going to have to ask for it in the script. Okay. So, uh, as far as, I mean, th this sounds like a very um, intense project. I mean, I, are you working with uh, other open source contributors, or, and, and how, are they, how do they get involved in, in helping to contribute to the core of Chocolatey? Yeah, uh, as far as packages, packages are a different idea. Um, Chocolatey has that distinct separation point where, um, you know, it's got its core and its utility, and then on the other side, all of the packages and the packages themselves uh, may or may not have issues. Uh, so that, but that's where a lot of the contributions come from. We have a team of about five folks that are working on Chocolatey Core and, and making it better. Uh, there's a couple of us, maybe just me at this time, working on the actual Chocolatey.org site. Uh, we're trying to bring some new features up to that, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't know. So we, we got five folks. We got another guy who works. One of those five folks also works on the uh, puppet package for Chocolatey. And then on the other side of that, the chef package is done by another guy. And he's not, he doesn't consider himself part of the, the core team yet mm -hmm. because he hasn't worked on Chocolatey itself. And so he's just providing that chef package and keeping it updated. And that's, that's awesome. Okay. So. Because I had I had interviewed uh, Mandy Walls from OpsCode uh, a few days ago, and uh, and she talked about how they can now do Windows Server. So that was was something I was about to get at. Was uh, does Chocolatey integrate with that? So it sounds like it does already. So right. how did these people come to to contribute? I mean, were these people you had already been working with, or uh, were they people you know, that found Chocolatey and were like, hey, this needs to be part of Chef or Puppet or X? Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is somebody found it, realized there was a need, and filled the need. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that's been pretty fantastic. Uh, we have a lot of community contributions coming to Chocolatey, even when I don't have time <laughs> to take a look at it. Um, but uh, I think right now we're sitting at 20 open pull requests, mm -hmm. which uh, which could be considered healthy, could be considered unhealthy. Um, uh, with work constraints, you know we're all human beings, so we only have a certain amount of time. And families. Yeah, and families. Only a certain, a finite amount of time to actually go and evaluate these. So uh, we try to keep that, that down under, uh, I really like to keep it under 10 pull requests at a time. Um, so, so you're using GitHub, obviously, uh, for, for managing the, the development yep. and the source code. Yep, and we have the wiki out there that, that, that talks about all the commands you can use and then all of the different... Uh, of the commands that you, I'm sorry, parameters and switches that you can apply to commands. So uh, some of the really interesting ones are if you want to download a particular package, but you don't like the silent arguments they're using or you want to put it in a, direct, a different directory, mm -hmm. you can actually override the arguments from the command line, which is kind of nice. Uh, yeah. One of the things we're working on as well is um, 
you know, what if there's not a chocolatey package or something, but you want to go ahead and just install it, so you want to speed that thing up. Uh, working on the ability to provide a URL mm-hmm. to a, an MSI or an executable, and then you could pass your silent arguments and just it'd be kind of a pseudo. It's not really a there's no package for it, but you get it installed. Right. So you wouldn't even need uh, any of that packaging infrastructure built up. Now, you, you have a history of, of being involved in these tools. You were involved in the creation of new, and which ultimately, uh, well, I mean, did it close down and become NuGet, or was that an entirely new code base when NuGet? I wasn't sure how that's all played out. Okay, so uh, now I was involved in new during the last two reboots. Mm-hmm. New was called InGem when it was originally uh, devised, and that was... Uh, uh, Nick, and I can't think of his last name right now. Uh, he's out of Iowa. And then David Larrabee and a couple of others. Uh, I think Chris uh, Patterson and Drew Sellers were even on the original. And then they renamed it to Nubular uh, about the time of 2008. Mm-hmm. And it was like the second reboot. And then there was a third reboot that came about, I want to say, in 2009 mm-hmm. or early 2010. And that reboot, I got involved with. I, I helped them with some of the, the stuff, but I didn't really work with the core guts of it. Uh, they're still trying to figure out some of that. And then, then that kind of uh, went to the wayside again. And then in early July that year, uh, 2010, um, one of my constituents said, you know, we could use Ruby as the infrastructure. I was like, yeah, I've been, I've been mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> It's not too far to see that you know people that want to use packaging could could install Ruby and not complain too much about it. Um, oh, come and so, on, they're on Windows. Of course, they can complain. I say that as a Rubyist, who they're known for complaining. So I say that with good nature. Not no no. Right. no. <laughs> it was was working, and we had a video out on it, and it kind of went viral. Yeah. And at, uh, we started getting popular very, very quickly because, you know, it was sorely needed in, inside of the .NET uh, space mm-hmm. for the packaging uh, infrastructure. And then Microsoft contacted us and said, hey, we're working on something we've been working on for a while, and we'd like you to help us uh, with that. And we got to look at where they were at with it, and we thought, wow, probably, you know, uh, easily a few months, if not a year ahead of us. Mm-hmm. In what they've done so far, plus you know they got people that are committed to this full time. Where you know we were just working on it in our spare time, and mm-hmm. so like you know we had two options at that point. We could you know kind of move our team to work with them and uh, let New sit down, or we could continue to work on New and uh, watch New get gain in popularity because it was coming from the Microsoft folks. Um, but possibly could be doing some things wrong, you know, that we'd already had experience with and, you know, through other packaging infrastructures mm-hmm. uh, and then try to guide, you know, guide the folks in the right direction. Areas where, you know, this problem is going to work or this isn't a good idea. Yeah. So you guys, while, while they were technically ahead on their platform, you guys had been through some of the rough patches already and, and vetted some ideas and find out, oh yeah, delivering it this way that has this problem, this problem, this problem. So you were able to provide some. Yeah, and they had they had started to look at like their version of rubygems.org. Um, we were able to, to help on some of that as well. Uh, we really liked the idea of some, some social aspects mm-hmm. and being able to, you know, I'm this user and I have this many packages and they have this many downloads, right? And all of that stuff was was kind of there, and they originally set it off out of order, and then have since moved to a custom implementation, which I think has been a, a really good choice. Um, so they could uh, do more with, you know, not having to wait for Orchard to move forward in some areas. Mm-hmm. So, and then the Codeplex. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm now I'm just drawing. Uh, draw, Drawing a blank, it was the Codeplex organization or the Codeplex. Um, what was the name of that? 
It was like, was the Complex Foundation. Complex Foundation, yes. Uh, so they, they founded that around yeah. that time. Was that directly because of the, the work you guys were doing with them for NuGet or because that was that was I'm trying that was Microsoft trying to say we're going to try to partner with open source developers on the Microsoft platforms and, they, and try to work more closely with them. And they renamed it to the Outer Curve Foundation. Outer uh, Curve, okay. After us, and that particular foundation is funded somewhat by Microsoft for the projects that they are putting developers on and for the projects that they are um, they think are good. But you, if you go out outercorefoundation.org, you're going to find that a lot of those are, are Microsoft related. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're all going to be in the Microsoft sphere, but they usually have Microsoft assets on them as well. Okay. And so they have their time to work on those projects. Okay. So um, by the time NuGet went there, I think NuGet was maybe the fourth or fifth project to get accepted into the Outer Curve Foundation. And it was kind of interesting. We had signed some paperwork uh, coming on to help with out, out with NuGet. That uh, and this was kind of uh, maybe a little ahead of its time for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Is Microsoft lawyers looked over it? Uh, lawyers at the company I, I I worked for looked over it to make sure that everything was good. But it was really about you know IP and, and protection of stuff. Um, and then we had to sign it again when it moved over. <laughs> when it moved to the outer curve. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and that that allows us to be contributors uh, on a large scale and. Uh, and today, I think they still ask for for folks to sign that if they're going to be contributing large uh, contributions to the the code base. Now, small contributions they don't require anything to be signed. Just uh, pass a code review and make the people on the project happy about it, and it can get put in. So it's one of the and what we've seen since you know Entity Framework is now open source, and so a whole bunch of more pro a whole bunch a whole bunch more projects started to, to move towards this for Microsoft, and I think that's a good move. Yeah, especially something that they uh, was so controversial. <laughs> well, I was, when I was still a .NET developer, when the Entity Framework was um, being promoted, it's, I use that as a euphemism for shove down throats, but uh, it, was, it was being promoted, but it sounds like that, that opening that up is letting maybe some people that have some of those strong opinions actually put uh, fingers to keyboards and try to get make things better yeah. instead of just sitting idly by waiting for the next um, initiative to come out of the mothership. It's, uh, and, and it's funny that this really leans why, to why we went to work on NuGet versus just sit to the side and, and work on our own project and, yeah. and uh, be a competitor. We didn't want another entity framework. <laughs> <laughs> so you helped make sure that it went in the right direction. Package management is pretty important, and, and the, the guys at Microsoft that were on this pro that uh, were on the project at the time we were on, they're pretty smart guys. I mean, we're talking about the ASP.NET team. Uh, yeah, yeah, Phil Hack and and who else was involved with that? Unless I mean, I, if you can't say, that's that's okay. You don't have to to name uh, names. But I know Phil Hack was publicly involved with it. David uh, Ebo, David Fowler, uh, Lewin, I can't think of his last name, but he's uh, on Twitter is uh, .NET Junkie. But, yeah, these were the guys that were on the project. There were some other people. Uh, oh, yeah, I can't, uh, can't leave without mentioning. Um, man. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. That's okay. Uh, but, well, yeah, there were some pretty good folks on the project. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know I'm gonna just uh, jump backwards a little bit further in time, and uh, you know you before NuGet before Chocolatey you worked on some other projects, uh, all the Chuck Norris the Chuck Norris suite of tools I'll call it the uh, <laughs> the uppercut the uh, uh, so it sounds like you've had a, a passion for automation and uh, streamlining workflow and and all of that in in the uh, .NET. How much, how much, uh, well, just if you want to really quickly describe what Uppercut was and what Roundhouse was, um, and, and just how those influenced and, and what experiences you got from working on those and people contributing um, and getting started with those projects and then carried forward into the work. I mean, were those things instrumental in helping you 
uh, formulate these ideas or or, or build uh, the concepts that were going to be required for the automation that you worked with uh, later in nougat and and uh, and uh, chocolatey. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of it is my foray into open source really came. I mean, into actually contributing open source came with the Chuck Norris project. Before it was called the Chuck Norris project, uh, we just had this idea of, you know, we have this infrastructure that we'd like to provide so that developers can really ramp up and, uh, you know, be able to focus on what they want to do, which is develop and not really focus on, you know, things like infrastructure, like, ah, I need to do database migration, mm -hmm. this expensive process of running the, you know, 20 scripts against the database. And then somehow keeping that up to date. And uh, just as an aside, going back to the other conversation, that Lewin's last name is Nguyen. And oh, okay. Drew and Matt Osborne were the other two guys. And of course, Scott Hanselman uh, at the top, uh, looking over this, him and uh, Scott Guthrie. So, and, oh, the, the big red shirt. Um, and of course, Scott was pretty instrumental in the, the entire process of, you know, Welcoming, welcoming, welcoming uh, non Microsofties onto a project and, and, and making that happen at Microsoft. So, mm -hmm. um, back to Chuck Norris. Uh, the Chuck Norris project uh, framework for us was a developer infrastructure. When I uh, when I started, uh, we were working on something that was we had at my company 78, 78 projects, not not like Visual Basic or Visual C Sharp, uh, not C Sharp project, but 78 repositories. Mm -hmm. Full-blown projects. Full-blown projects. And we needed to, to standardize the way we were building all of these. So we needed to get an automated build on all of them. And uh, for us, the answer was not to put it on a build server and just point to the solution file and say, that's your build. Because that's nothing more than compile. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't run your unit tests. That doesn't, you know, run any analytics on it, like in depend or in cover or open cover or whatever. That, uh, so what we were looking for, and it doesn't do any versioning for you, so what we were looking for was a good way to automate that. And so we started with this, uh, these NANT scripts. And uh, NANT, for those that don't know, is this thing from, from quite a while ago that's uh, a derivative of ANT which is an XML build tool for Java, and it was ported to .NET. It still never reached version 1. Oh, it still has not hit. It was always 0 0.96 something. 0 0.2, I think, is the most recent. Oh, wow. It, that's... Uh, we needed a way to have build scripts, and, and uh, at the time, we started out with that, and um, we started to learn that we could template out parts of this, and so we could drop in a... Uh, Basically, what would be considered templated NANT into these uh, to this directory, and then we could set up all of our um, configuration in one particular file, and so we could have the same thing for every project. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're like, "Well, this is pretty interesting. We could open source this. Mm -hmm. uh, call it, call it, we'd call it Uppercut." Uh, the interesting, the really interesting thing about this, and if you're a company that's listening and say, "Well, why would you open source something?" Um, is that what we open sourced and what it became after it was open sourced are two almost two entirely different products. Because before it was open source it was it was it only had to apply to certain company things. Mm -hmm. And when it went more open source, it became like I would consider two to three hundred percent better. Uh, we we moved away from we made some of the, the configuration stuff better. We started to moving into more uh, the ability to write hooks. Mm -hmm. You needed to um, customize certain sections like a pre post or a replace hook for like if you did your versioning in a different way uh, all of that stuff came once it was open sourced and the company benefited from benefited from it yeah, so. so you had something that wasn't a core competency that you were just using i mean you created to use in house took that thing that it's like this isn't on our bottom line this is just some stuff put it out where other people could use it they use it Contributed back to it, and then you reap those benefits back in house. Yeah, that's that's a huge play for why if you have something that's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
that your company needs to protect. That you yeah. should. Well, that's why that's why I say core competency because it's it's not something that that business needs to survive. It's not a revenue generator. It's not a diff really a differentiator. Um, it's it's not a competitive advantage. I mean, it is a competitive advantage, but it's not something it's not something that somebody else couldn't, yeah. given the time and resources, create themselves. Really interesting. If it, when it goes open source, it can become a competitive advantage for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, when, it, when the value comes back. So the value starts coming back if you're like, oh, this came out of this, uh, this place where these people are working. Oh, and yeah, goodwill and, and, and um, recruiting, good old recruiting. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and so that became the first thing. Uh, and then the second project out of that was, actually I think warm-up became the second one, uh, and that was worked on by my buddy Drew Sellers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a token replacement tool. And so you can set up uh, files, folders, some structure, and then check it into source control, and then be able to um, generate from that thing whatever it is that you want. So you have some sort of standard structure. So you start it was your, your entire solution, all of the the packages that you needed and everything, right? Or at the time those were just references, right? Everything you needed, and you check that in, and you could actually write unit tests, and you could put an automated build on that, and you could be testing your templates and everything uh, because it's just uh, it's a naming convention that changes it, right? And then when you generate it out, the infrastructure already set up so that two to two or three days to a week or whatever that most people say. Well, we're setting up the infrastructure for the project. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and I've used your warm-up. I used warm-up on, on a few small projects just to, because it was able to drop and create a structure and not have to think too much about it. And uh, move forward, if you go to Chocolatey and you read through the Create Packages page at the bottom, mm -hmm. it has some templates that you can install. So that you could uh, use warm up to quickly generate out your package details and then just add in the stuff that's necessary from there. Plus, you can get all those little helpers inside of the template. So you choose what you need and get rid of the rest. Wrap mm -hmm. so was my. We were looking at Tarantino. And Tarantino, for those that don't know, did uh, database migrations with SQL files, which is what we were looking for. Um, but it didn't really do well. It didn't really do well with, well, I'd like some of the source control, and I'd like to maintain, say, a view or a store procedure or a function or something else uh, in the same file, right? Mm -hmm. because oh, you're kind of cutting out a little bit. Oh. Good to hear? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tarantino would require that you put all of your files into the same folder, uh, this being an up type folder, and then... When you made changes to views, functions, or whatever, that all just became part of the next script. Oh, okay. Track. And we were looking at making changes, and at the time, I don't think that the, uh, the maintainers were very receptive to that. Uh, plus, we, uh, we did contribute back. We made it work with MS Build. Um, we didn't see the... Uh, I don't think it's ever been accepted, so... <laughs> that particular patch... Um, and so we're like, okay, so clearly this isn't going to be the, uh, the future that we're going to work with, uh, so we need to implement uh, a different solution. Mm -hmm. Started working on that from ground zero. And by commit 27, I think we were, um, we were able to be uh, what would be considered the Tarantino features complete. Oh. Uh, and well, I mean, there's something to have uh, a reference implementation. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then we're all the way over 300, so uh, now, uh, maybe over 400 commits. Um, but, you know, we had these ideas. We wanted to be, we wanted it to have a super simple configuration. It uh, be a, a SQL migration engine execution, uh, migration execution engine. So it's not actually uh, a migration framework, uh, which is nice because then you can actually hook any migration framework that can generate SQL files into Roundhouse. Okay. So like Entity Framework, uh, uh, SQL Migrate, uh, sorry, Fluent Migrator, uh, those can be created as plugins, 
where it can take the migration um, code and then have it flipped into a SQL file. The nice thing about that is you give the SQL file to the DBAs and they say, yeah, you're next. Uh, the other thing that Roundhouse really does well is this concept of global versioning, but the way you want it to work. And so you can pass an XML file or a DLL and say, use this for versioning. Right. And so the really nice thing about that is you're now versioning your database. You're, if you're also versioning your code, you can actually be in sync. So when you deploy your code, you deploy your database, you can say, yep, we're on the same version, so we're good. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, it, it's, it's also nice to know that there was a lot more thought than it just being a Rails clone. I think that was some people thought, well, that's just the, the active record migrations. Um, but but it's, it's, it, it, was, it was solving the same problem, but in its own way, and it had its own design influences. Right. And for us also, we were looking at the idea that uh, we needed some Sarbanes Oxley. Uh, uh, the company was a bank. So we needed to have Sarbanes Oxley implemented in, in all of these different tools. So a lot of the Chuck Norris tools are very uh, compliant with Sarbanes Oxley. Mm -hmm. so that goes on, you know who it is that's making the changes, a lot of that stuff. And then what is changing and how does this translate back to source control? Okay. And so that was huge, and so we tried to make sure that we designed all of that uh, appropriately. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, sit down and chat with me today. Well, thanks. Thanks right. for having me. Sure.